This episode of Life After includes content warnings for a brief mention of suicide and sexual abuse. Remember that you can find the Life After podcast on Facebook for our secret community to find other people you know to deconstruct with. So it's not just you deconstructing alone. Um, It's a nice place. We've got moderators. I am a huge fan. When you go in there, there'll be a few questions for you to ask just to weed out the people that we don't want to be in there. And it's a good time. Just a friendly reminder of our Patreon and also the merch that is now on TeePublic. Thank you for joining me today. This is Bree Harden, and you are listening to the Life After Podcast. You may have noticed in the last few episodes, I've been kind of focusing on the word theology, that it's said to be how a culture tells its story, but because it's centered on the character, the theistic idea of God, then the story is told through that lens. Those of us who may have repressed ourselves or that we dealt with a deep sense of shame for being queer or lost community or cried out to a, quote, God and never was able to get something back that felt like was affirming or understanding of our identity and seeing us where we are. So so theology is said to be how a culture tells its stories, but there seems to be assumptions rammed into the premise that when it goes through its practice, when it's practiced today, it kind of puts the cart before the horse and it leaves some of us out of the narrative. But but here's one thing I've been learning since deconstructing, and that is if we use human-to-human language to explain our human experiences, our empathy can grow for one another without the sexual shaming or the phobia in each other or the hella problematic rules or the wonky historical narratives that comes along with organized religion or organized spirituality. But, but empathy is when humans see human experiences as our shared experience, but there's no are for all queer people when it comes to God in this time and space. Now, when there's so many people deconstructing Christian beliefs, but especially for us who tried God out and didn't find the affirmation that we deserved. But bottom line is when when storytelling is centric on God, we fail to hear the voices of those who don't fit into the God narrative. It's the same pattern that we see in fighting systems of oppression. The dominant culture is the one left telling the story. We can outsmart it. When we use our common experiences as the point, when we make that the point, The stories find themselves centered on empathy, humanity, and real life progression. It's all about sharing the things that we learned, the things that we have discovered through going on journeys on our own. And we can go back to our friends and community and share those things together. Another deconstruction lesson that I've learned is that when humans aren't given a voice because their experience isn't convenient or welcomed into the cultural storytelling, uh, people create new ones. And I, I just don't mean like new podcasts, though, yeah, that is a part of it right now, but new voices and new cultures, new storytelling methods, everything, or as the Vulcan philosophy states, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. For this episode of Life After, I'm talking to my new friend, Jamar Rogers. He is a HIV activist who deconstructed hard. And instead of advertising his life towards some sort of God narrative, he talked about his real life experience and represented his humanity so that when other people are going through the same situations of either having to repress their sexuality or losing relationship with family members or getting a diagnosis of HIV, they're able to know that somebody went through that same thing and they came out 
more of who they are. If, if Jamar Rogers can do it, then, then they can do it. That is the representation of humanity instead of us advertising some sort of deity that is just rooting from us from the sidelines. When we can see a human and even tweet at them or Facebook them or whatever and interact with them, have a meaningful conversation, when we can see other humans that are just like us to find out, that they're able to do it, then we also can do it. We can, we can find that same motivation and influence by listening to their stories, learning how they got through, and then making that elixir that they found our inspiration, kind of that map that lets us know where we need to be going or a voice telling us where we need to go. God, I know that was really bad. Yes, Jamar, he was on American Idol and then on The Voice, but I'm going to let him tell his story. Um, here is my conversation with the one and only Jamar Rogers. Let me put on that for you a little bit. Jamar, welcome to The Life After. How are you today? Oh, I'm so great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been long overdue. I mean, we've been following each other on Twitter, and it's one of those weird things where I, I hear it when people talk about the podcast, where it's like, oh, I listen to this, and I feel like I know who you are. <laughs> I feel the same with your Twitter. I just feel like oh yeah, we're friends, we go way back. But that's not really the case, but it kind of is. Like, oh, it's what? so cosmic. I feel like I've known you forever too. <laughs> Just so you know, it's mutual. It's mutual. <laughs> Good. Well, then I feel less like a creep. And any, and I, I guess you understand this too, growing up in fundamentalism, being gay, any opportunity that we have to feel less like a creep, we're going to take it. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, let's get the um, the ridiculous bullshit out of the way. How do you introduce yourself to some random person on the street? Um, mm. And then we're going to go into what is, who is Jamar in the context of the life after and you know the of like the religion of it all yeah yeah well when i meet somebody on the street i just say hey what's up i'm jamar uh i <laughs> that's just who i am uh but if um i do have a hell of a story and i don't I, didn't, I don't think i realized how momentous my story was until you start sharing it and and then you right. see people's reactions <laughs> right right and um and uh side note that's just why i think that sharing your story is extremely liberating i think that as you begin to tell more of what has happened to you more of what you have survived more of what you have thrived through you break the shackles of shame so here's my story yes. um i was i was born into church church my earliest memories are of being in church of the music I was born on a Tuesday, Sunday, I was in church. Uh, my, mom was <laughs> well, my mom was 19 when she had me and she got saved while she was pregnant with me. Um, wow. And, and she, she got saved in the Pentecostal faith. So um, very, very strict, you know, for the first six years of my life, I didn't see my mom wear any makeup or pants. Um, it was just, you know, very strict. I love so the music. It was like more of like the skirts and like yes, the, the jean jump. skirts. Okay. Yeah, you already yes. know. Uh, I, well, with I the knew long a woman hair at our church at, that I grew up with, and she was just known for always wearing a jean jumper. And I always remember <laughs> like that commercial of McDonald's where Ronald McDonald went into his closet, and it's just the same costume over and over. That's, I, I, yeah. We went over to her house for a pool party and I went to her and it was the same thing, but with jean jumpers. <laughs> yeah, that's, yes, uh, yes. it's, it's like a uniform. It's like, it's your, it's yes. your, it's your daily uniform so that you, uh, quote unquote, please God. Um, so I grew up in a very, uh, we, I grew up speaking in tongues, the music, um, because we were so strict, you know, I, I didn't have Christ, uh, unchristian friends growing up. You know, we weren't unequally yoked. I, you know, went to right. Awana. I had oh, the God, salty. Yes. 
Yeah, I had the salty experience with Gospel Bill, okay, and can I we mean, talk about can we talk about salty for a moment. <laughs> we I'm can. sorry, but like every I was picture that I every I was picture obsessed. that I go back and I look at 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 salty, I'm like, it looks creepy. This is a little bit like blackface or something. It looks a right? little creepy. <laughs> it's blue face. Yes. Um, or spine. I mean, it's technically <laughs> his spine. If we want to get technical. <laughs> but like, it's like, oh, oh my man. God. This should not be. This should not have happened. <laughs> no, it's, but you know, it was the 80s. Lots of strange things right. were happening. I mean, there so was many. Carmen's music videos that were obsessed oh with witchcraft God. and the devil. So, I mean, like, they're, they're, like we were obsessed oh. with the devil in the 80s and the 90s. So mm -hmm. um, that the, was my the childhood. The satanic had, panic was oh, a big part, my, right? Yeah. Oh, it was huge. I wasn't allowed to watch any cartoons with magic in it. So, you know, no He-Man. No, Ninja Turtles. He a master of it. Oh, God, no, no, absolutely mm -hmm. not. No, mm -hmm. no Little Mermaid. Because, you know, just nothing that had witchcraft or wizardry, you know, was allowed. So I grew up very bad, very sheltered. I was homeschooled for a few years. Where are um, you? Oh, oh I, I mean, like we, I, we were in it. <laughs> we were really in it, and and the and the curriculum was a Christian curriculum. Like that was just my life. It was my right. foundation. It was my everything. My mom eventually did get married uh, to a man when I was six, and they they had my little sister. And then we stopped being so like uh, we weren't Pentecostal. Then we became non-denominational uh mm -hmm. which was the same shit. Just you could wear pants and makeup. <laughs> like it was still very religious. Um. But it was and still I like a I little was, step back from like the rules and regulations. True, a little, uh, a little bit. Just, I mean, like I said, we still, maybe. <laughs> uh, so my, my, my parents' rules were every time the church's doors are open, we're there. And not only are we yes. th there, we're there early. So God forbid if there's a, a revival or a winter Bible conference, we're there every day. And my parents would let me miss school before I could miss church. Um, wow. That's just like, like God God came before everything. And because I knew I was gay as a young child, I, I knew at the age of seven, I was going to seven. hell. Yeah. Damn, yes. And so I was depressed and suicidal at seven. I, I remember Shit. thinking like, something's not right with me. I don't feel like everybody else. And I think I'm going to go to hell for this. And my mom was really hard on me because I was a very feminine child. Um, she was always like, you know, watch your wrists. That's not how boys walk. That's not how boys talk. The of how you have yes. to like sit and not cross yes. your legs, all that. Bullshit. Yes, all of that. And so I, I had, to, I learned to criticize myself at a very young age yes. between my mother's voice and then the voice of what I thought mm -hmm. God was, which was, oh. I'm just never good enough. You know, and then every Sunday we're singing, I'm a wretch. Oh, I'm desperate. I'm nothing without you. Well, I mean, you start to internalize that shit that you are nothing without God. The way that I look at it is we, we get those messages and they, it's not just that we just have those messages, but they kind of like all kind of create this. I used to call it like an internal Kellyanne Conway but I feel like she's outdated, outdated now, thank God. But you just get like this like gaslighting AI that lives inside of your brain. Yes, perfect. And then it starts like spouting all out of this bullshit that you hear enough of it and you know what that voice would be saying in that situation. Yes. Yes. And it got to the point that in school, every time I thought a boy was cute, I was repenting. I was Fuck, repenting same. every two to three minutes. Do you understand what that does? Um, yes, I do. <laughs> like to your, to your mental health and then yes. you're going through puberty and like, it was just a lot. Right. A um, lot. My but parents, you knew you when you're seven, I'm, I, I did. I used to, I, I was attracted to a little curly head. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't put together till I was like 14 that really? I was like, Oh, this is a thing that I'm going to have to deal with because I think I was just, I was a little bit of a late bloomer and I was a little mm. bit more repressed. Um, when you were seven, like, do you have anything that's like, <laughs> oh, this is yeah. the thing that I'm like. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Like, this is it has what to do with, is. It has to do with Salty. Um, there was one of his <laughs> okay. videos. There was okay. one of his videos that I watched every day. And there was this little curly haired blonde boy that sang 
in the little group Get and out. I was in love with him. I just thought he was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Oh my yeah, God. I used to pretend it was it was this it was the salty videotape where they're on a camping trip. And so I used to pretend I was going camping with them. I would sing all the songs that like I was. But also I was molested between the ages of four and six. Okay. So I was exposed. I was exposed to things that I should not have been exposed to. So, so like in my mind, at, working in a way. Oh that, yeah. yeah. In my mind at seven, when I saw that little curly haired boy, he was my, I was in love with him. And I, I mean, I imagined us doing things together. So I was, I just, I was, I had a, a lot of issues and I, I think that I would have really benefited from therapy at a very young age. <laughs> totally. But yeah. I gratefully did not have that experience of molestation and, it was a weird thing too when I was deconstructing because I had to really question myself of like, did some stuff go down that I didn't think mm. of or that like, mm. you know, and it's, it's also a weird thing too with us as queer people that we were taught that that's what made us. Made gay. you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. I remember one of the first times that um, I was outed to my mom Drama, wow. drama but that was like the first thing was like did something happen and i had to answer that question like three times like i was fucking peter answering jesus or something <laughs> and there wasn't anything but it made me have to question myself in a way that isn't appropriate right but to double check and sure, sure. there wasn't anything that happened and I'm grateful and I'm so fucking sorry to hear your oh, experience involved that. Thank you. I, I look back at like boys that I was like thought were cute and that I was attracted to back then. Yeah. I mean, I remember even with Barney, there was, you know, the, the, the secular salty, if we will, and then there was the little rascals movie that came out. Oh was, yeah. Was, was so I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I, I love that we <laughs> kind of grew up in that same era. So yeah. We get it. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Oh man. That was, like I said, we were in it. I think the biggest change happened when we moved to Oklahoma. Uh, right before my freshman year in high school. Uh, tell me about that. And we moved, uh, we moved there so that my parents could go to Bible college at a place called Rama. Um, Rama, and I've heard of. Yes. Oh, yeah, and um, that. Wow, it was it was a horrible but necessary experience. Um, horrible because it ultimately tore my family apart. Wow. Uh, but necessary because my family needed to be torn apart so that we could all <laughs> learn these lessons. Bow, bow. Um, I, I was still very, I was pretty feminine kid at 14. And um, it was my first time really experiencing racism. Up until then, I had lived in LA and Vegas, just West Coast vibes, um, very multicultural vibes. But in Oklahoma, it was very segregated. And um, it was the first time I'd been called the N word um, and by Christians. <laughs> it was by Christians. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And um, it's, it's, it's really okay because um, as you, You'll hear me say, when I tell my story, I'm grateful for everything that's happened because it's made me who I am today. And exactly. I love the person that I am today. And me too. Uh, but to, to move... Oh, thank you, Brady. I'm going <laughs> to keep you around. Um, <laughs> to speed this up, at Rama, so I was there for a youth group. I was on the prison worship team because I could always sing. And that was always my saving grace in church. Everybody pretty much knew I was gay uh, because it wasn't like, I was just that kid. Um, but because I could sing and they're like, wow, he's so anointed. Every time he sings, like people cry, they give their life to Christ. Like, you know, God's going to do something with him. So I always had that like in my back pocket, I sang on the prison worship team and I was very attracted to the piano player and the drummer. And so we did things. Um, we all had girlfriends who were friends with each other. Whoa, whoa, whoa. When but the you three, say when you did things, are you saying like we like did at things? The same time? Um, that happened one time. <laughs> that happened one time. Most of the times it happened separately. I was like the common denominator. Um, but we, so if yeah, I can we were kind all of best talk friends. About archetypes here. You're the Jean Grey. <laughs> The drummer is probably the Wolverine and the piano player is probably Cyclops. Am I understanding this right? That's a great, that, I think that's a pretty appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was I, uh, I told someone in the youth group and you have to understand Rainbow was what you know, is a mega church. So the youth group had a good 800 kids in it. 
Mm. And I trusted the wrong person in the youth group. And he went and told the youth pastor. (laughs) So then the youth pastor confronted the guys first and they denied it. They were like, no, no, no. But when he confronted me, I was honest. I was like, well, yes, I did say that. And yes, it did happen. So then he called all three of us into the office. This was all before Wednesday night service. He calls us all in together. And he's like, Jamar is saying this happened. These two are saying it's not. It didn't. Who's telling the truth? And they both just, I'll never, I just can't forget the look they gave me, which was like, wow, you said something? And once they said that, like, we all like told on ourselves. And so then the pastor was like, well, either you tell your parents or I will. And that's the first time I tried to kill myself because I wanted to die than tell my mom what had happened. And from that moment, I was ostracized big time from the youth group because even though the boys admitted it to the pastor, the word that spread around the youth group was Jamar made it up and that Jamar was lying on these two straight holy boys. So then the pastor's kids couldn't hang out with me anymore. It was like, it was like a very swift fall from grace. Um, my mom kept me home from school for a few days and she called out from school and work and said that we were dealing with a family emergency and Good you know, we her. did the whole, like, like, well, no, 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 no. It wasn't, no, it was a family emergency in the sense that her son is gay and we have to deal with this. Cause, uh, and that's, and I remember, I remember looking at her like, mom, come on. You didn't know, like, really, you didn't know. Yeah. And she's like, oh, no, 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 not in my house. Because in this house, we serve the Lord. In this no, house, you know, student. like, okay, okay, yes, all of that. I was like, so I, I had appreciate to quit. that she, like, dropped what she needed to do oh, to take care no. of her kid. But now I'm understanding no, no, it's no. more of, like, a PR. I need to fix oh, yes. some shit. I'm, like, oh, uh, yes. And I had scandal. just applied to work yeah. with the nursery, like, the kids in the nursery. They they negated my application. They said I couldn't work with the kids because oh, fuck I guess I'm, I must be yeah. a pedophile because I'm attracted to guys. I'm I'm 15. I'm 15 internalizing all of this. Um, so of course I was super depressed. Um, that happened. Eventually, I ended up running away from home uh, at the age of 17. And from so for my whole senior year in high school, I couch surfed. I lived with friends. Um, I developed a drinking problem. Uh, but I, I, I stopped going to that church. I tell you what, I, st- I stopped dealing with those schools Fuck, and, man. um, and I got a fake ID and then I, I completely immersed myself in, uh, in sinful living. I, um, I even remember saying to God, like, I heard that, you know, everyone gets their season of sin. I want my season. I want my season to just be me, to just do me. That's and springer. I now realize, yeah. yeah, I now realize that that was my heart, my heart was saying, I cannot live not being true to myself. Please give me a moment where I can be me. But because I could not articulate that, I I had a whole lot of self-loathing and the self-loathing is what got me into trouble. So maybe we want to stop there for a moment. I don't know. God. (sighs) Okay. There's just so (laughs) many parallels. Like, I mean, I was here in the Midwest. I was in St. Louis. And so... Okay. Like oh, everything yeah. that you did was 10 years ahead of me and my experience. So <laughs> okay. way to go being smarter <laughs> and <laughs> more with it than me. Because I don't know if it's smarter, but <laughs> <laughs> my only output for the longest time was just like a chat room of bullshit. And yeah. that yeah. was like my only access because I was just so I was so fucking afraid and I was so like the goody goody, like I follow the rules. I do what I need to. And I love that you were like more willing to break out of that and kind of were able to hit that process sooner. Mm. And Mm. it kind of got you into some weird ass places. (laughs) It Um, definitely did. (laughs) I went, uh, we need to take a break and we get back. You're singing where that took you. Um, and then I want to talk about what that's meant with your walking away from all of this bullshit. Um, yeah, sure. When we get back from the break. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, when we come back, we'll talk about uh, being homeless, the meth addiction, and how I found my way on The Voice. The Voice. Jesus. <laughs> this is such a weird fucking this is such a it's weird a fucking story. episode because it's like <laughs> you strip away like the goddamn voice of it all and like you are the quintessential episode of like 
who and what I like who I want to speak to. And then it's like, oh yeah, you were also on the fucking voice. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, we will be right back uh, right after this uh, beautiful lame ass commercial. They say that nostalgia is a really powerful force. And now that I'm producing a life after podcast on my own, I could use all of the help that I can get. So I went back to the drawing board and updated the show's Patreon program so I can keep the candle burning. On the Life Afters page on Patreon.com, you'll find several monthly contribution tiers you can choose from. Each includes digital rewards like infographics inspired by episodes, videos, sound bites, and each tier includes its own merch like stickers, mugs, posters, plus one tote bag. Find the Life After on Patreon today. You don't want to be left behind, or even left behind teen series. And keep in mind, the Life After. Find the Life After on Patreon.com and let's party like it's WoW 1999. Welcome back to Life After. I wanted to start off by mentioning this is the first episode of Only Queer People, which has been my plan from the beginning. I mean, Chuck, I let, you know, kept him around for 50 episodes, straight people, blah, blah, blah. But now <laughs> it is it is only queers. Queers only. It's that gay uh, agenda at work. <laughs> that's right. Um the next step in your story, yeah. um, things get hard. Yeah. And what, what did you experience? Well, this was uh, actually the first time I left church. I was on my own. I was away from my family. Um, and I, because I internalized so much self-hate, I, I brought along a lot of destruction to myself. I brought on destruction to myself. Uh, I was an alcoholic. I... Cocaine led to a uh, crystal meth. And so between the ages wow. of 18 and 23, I was addicted to crystal meth. I was transactional with my body. I, uh, I would steal from my friends. And I mean, I was just a mess. <laughs> I was a mess. Not to mention and I meth, had just some. And meth, oh, meth is hard to quit. Is, is a big oh, yeah. Deal within the gay queer community. Oh, well. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I found that it was it. Meth gave me the freedom to let myself be gay without condemning myself but the moment i came down you know i condemned myself so the point was just to stay as high as possible so i could be okay with myself um but then i got really sick i got very 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 sick sick to the point of being rushed to the emergency room and um it was there that i found out that i had hiv actually at that time i had aids i did not have hiv i had five t-cells i was about to die they said if i had i they said if i had waited uh, even an extra day, who knows what would have happened. So, um, but I, I will tell you this though. Here's what's funny. I, um, no matter what anyone's philosophical or religious belief might be, I do believe in something. I'm not going to say greater than me, but I do believe in a creator. I do believe in this, this energy, this loving energy that we can tap into whenever we need to. Right. And in that moment where the doctor told me, you know, you, you have HIV, I felt this warmth from the crown of my head and it just like traveled all the way down my body. And in that instant, I knew I wasn't going to die. I knew that I was going to be okay. And I called my mom from the hospital. This was our first time speaking in two years. We had had a falling out. She didn't know where I was. I called her from the hospital. I said, Hey, they're saying that I have HIV and I need to get my life together. Can I move in with you? Um, which was interesting. Um, so I moved in with my mom for a couple and that, and at the time I actually had a, I don't want to call her a girlfriend. I'm going to call her a best friend who we told everyone that we were dating because she had just had a baby. And I wanted people so desperately to believe that the baby was mine, even though I, it definitely was not. <laughs> um, and so we joined this church. We moved to Wisconsin. We joined a church. I thought that I had gotten AIDS, HIV, because I had been living a life of sin, you know, like what we've been taught. So I was like, you know what? It would make I got, sense, right? Yeah. I got my season of sin. Look what happened. So the, I, w I became even more on fire for God. I became mm -hmm. whew, very right. Phariseeic, very judgmental, very weird. Um, and when I joined that church, they made me marry that girl. Um, even though I told fire. the pastor, I told the pastor that I had HIV and I told the pastor that 
the baby wasn't mine. She was just my best friend and that I agreed to help raise the baby. And to them, appearances, they said that we needed to abstain from the appearance of evil. And so since we lived together, then we needed to get married. And the way that the pastor saw it, this was a great avenue for my deliverance to help me with my deliverance. Um, because here was a woman who was willing to love me unconditionally. Um, and where else am I going to find a woman that's going to sleep with a guy that has HIV? That's what he was basically saying, you know, so you might as well stick this one out. And I remember after a year of being married, I was crying in their office saying, guys, I just can't sleep with her. I just, I'm trying. I'm really, really trying. And the pastor's wife, she was like, you need to confess every day. I love my wife. My wife is a Proverbs 31 woman. She's the woman that's meant for me. None of it worked, Brady. It just didn't work. And she ended up cheating on me (laughs) because we weren't having sex. Um, And I don't blame her for that. She ended up sleeping with a guy from the church. Um, So there's that. Uh, That happened in that church. Um, so we, we decided to split up and that was very embarrassing because I, you know, I had position in the church, uh, but the church rallied around me. It was, I I just, around that time I auditioned for American Idol with another worship leader and he had a hell of a story. And so he ended up getting third place that year on American Idol. And he's very famous now. He has Grammys. He's a very popular Christian artist. Um, y'all can Google it. I'm not about to start name dropping. Um, (laughs) and I, um, I did not. I got sent home that season and I had to go back to waiting tables. And the church was looking at me as though the reason I was in this position of God not showing me favor was because I had a life of sin. Um, whereas it all goes this back person, to that just cause and effect vacuum. Of, yes. We've got to fill up this bullshit of, yeah, it's so. In order to get God to bless me. Yeah, yeah. Um, or I'm not in the will of God. So. I I bought into it and that's where a a lot of self-loathing and self-hatred came in. Um, Mm. But I finally, I started dating a guy during that time and then the church found out. Well, actually my mom told on me. (laughs) My mom told the pastors. Yes. And I was a grown, I was a grown ass man. I was 29 at this time. Your mom um, is such an interesting character in your story. She definitely has been, we have become from (laughs) villains to best friends. Yes. Yes. She definitely... She definitely was a villain for a lot of time. And, 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 and the good news is she deconstructed at the same time I did. So that's, uh, that's where healing whoa, has whoa, come whoa, through whoa, whoa, for whoa. us. Your mom is I'm deconstructed. Okay. Completely 1000%. So wait, wait, we'll get don't to that. Tell me we'll cross more. that bridge. I cannot okay. wait to hear that. Oh my so, God. I want to give you a big ass hug right now. That's so exciting. <laughs> oh, to oh, a virtual hug right here, right here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. So after, after I'm sent home from American Idol, the mm-hmm. church sits me down for having this boyfriend. Um, and which in retrospect was one of the best things that they could have ever done, though I was really? embarrassed, um, though I was embarrassed and humiliated because they did it in between service. You know, how, I don't know if you went to a, a, a church that had two morning services, but we had an 8 a.m. Okay. and an 11 a.m. And I sang right, at both right. services and I led the 8 a.m. and they sat me down before 11 a.m. And, um, but I still had to sit there. I still had to sit there and people were like, why aren't you up there? You know, just the shame, you know, you've been disfellowshipped, you know what it's like. Uh, (laughs) 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 Um, I hated my mother. I cursed her out. I couldn't believe she betrayed me. It was just a a rough time. Well, that relationship that I was in at the time turned out to be very abusive and very harmful and toxic. And I ended up moving to New York, just leaving everything behind, Wow. leaving the church, leaving everyone I knew. Moving to New York at this time, you know, I, I didn't have a wife anymore. I, I was feeling you were in little, Oklahoma was, all the way up to this point, correct? Well, I, I, well, no, I had I bounced around a little bit. I met my ex wife in Atlanta. When I found out my HIV status, I was down south. We moved to Wisconsin. That's right. You Which, said yeah. Wisconsin. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've lived everywhere. I've been everywhere, <laughs> and it's because I'm trying to like give you the cliff nose version because we ain't trying to touch. No, on you're good. You're good. You're good. But um, once I was in New York is where I, I joined another church just because, you know, habit, that, that, right. that's what you, what you do. That's how you um, find community. Exactly. I didn't know how to make yeah. friends outside of church and I didn't fit in in the gay community. No matter how much I tried to hang out with them, I still was just this very sheltered Christian person that just didn't, that, mm-hmm. that wasn't vibing. Um, and I know you can relate. So um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, during, while I was at the church in New York, I auditioned for The Voice and uh, that's, that's where my life really began because it was throughout the process of the voice that I felt the courage to share my story of having HIV. Um, Mm. And after I shared that story on NBC to 14 million people, my life changed. I suddenly had a career. Suddenly people wanted to hear what I had to say. And though I wasn't living my authentic truth, 
I did start to understand that, okay, if I tell the truth, people won't shun me like I thought that they would, you know? And that's such a weird process of it coming is. to where things where everything was based on saying the truth is this one thing, but now it's like, wait, for me to be authentic about my experience means kind of not just saying something that's different than what you grew up with, mm-hmm. but ostracizing yourself almost from that community yes. because yes. everything's based on that message. Yes. Yes, you, you're disfellowshipping yourself. Right, <laughs> it's right. Like, why would I do that? Um, the thing is, when I got off the voice, I was still pretty, pretty hardcore Christian. Um, so I took a position as a youth pastor at a church out here in California. Um, and around that time, I also met another girl. And I, I was repeating patterns. Um, I still didn't. I still thought that I, you, I thought that being gay was okay for other people. That's where I was kind of getting, but I felt like God wanted more for me. For some reason, everybody else could live their lives, but not Jamari because God held me to a different standard, which is really ego when you think about it. Um, but that, anyways, so I started seeing this, this girl and the pastors of the church in California did not like her. Uh, they didn't feel like she submitted to their authority enough. Um, and okay. so they were trying, yeah, good they were trying her. to act actively- <laughs> good, seriously good for her um, because she she just she she accused me of drinking the Kool-Aid. I was I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I did what I had done in every church. I submitted my everything over to them and I let them tell me how to live my life. And I almost let them convince me to break up with her um, and oh. to be with another woman that they wanted to set me up with. But oh finally, I, I'm, I'm going to and this is going to sound really woo woo. So if you can just bear with I'm me. With him. I'm with but you. I had a vision. I had a vision, Brady. I had a vision of their hearts. And I wow. saw how they just weren't good people. They just weren't good people. And once I saw that, it was almost like I couldn't ignore it in the meetings anymore. What did that look like? What did you see that like? I saw, it was like a little whisper that said to me, stop giving your power to these people. Yes. And then I just saw what could only be described as wickedness. I don't even like to subscribe to that word, but I began to see how they used the people in their church. I don't know. It was like in a moment, yeah, yeah, in a moment, my eyes were open to how they were and how they, they lived so lavishly and how they talked shit about their congregation. And, and and, yeah, it was just, it was, it was, you know, he was like, like? this is not the heart of God. (laughs) This is not the heart of God. Do you know who you sound like? Who is that? Our 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 queen and master, um, Cleo Brittany. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That yes, was her thing. Yes. It, she didn't leave Scientology because she one day was like, "Man, this is some weird alien volcanoes or whatever." <laughs> she saw people being assholes and living yes. lavishly. The top people. At yes. Tom Cruise's wedding of all places, and it realized, no, 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 yes. no, 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 and it, that yes. there was a disconnect. And then, and then, what came next is the beliefs, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You, that's exactly what came next. Because after I left that congregation, I was like, I don't think I can go to church anymore. Not like. I, I'm seeing the same thing with every church I'm going to. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that there's other churches out there that are not like that, I'm sure. But at the same time, what I was finding in every church I went to was just this control, just control, control, control. Systemic. Mm-hmm. So when I read Pagan Christianity, I don't remember who turned me on to that book. I remember grieving. I was depressed for weeks because you have to understand, we, I had always been taught, and I'm sure you were that pagan. Paganism was wrong. It's horrible. But then I was reading in this book, all of the ways the Christian church adopted all these pagan practices. And I said, well, what the hell are we doing? Does, what am I doing? Am I wasting my time? What's happening here? And that's when I began to seek out everything, Brady. I began visiting all sorts of things that had been forbidden to me. I made a nine hour bus trip to go visit the Santero who worked with Santeria and, and the Orishas, but I felt like I needed to meet him. And I, and I, I spent time with these gods and goddesses. I went chanting with these, these Buddhists in upstate New York. I, I, I went on this, like, I know there's something out there, right. But it's more than what I've been exposed to. And I want to find it. I want to feel it. I want to see it. I want to touch it, taste it. And I did, I experienced all sorts of things. It really opened my eyes. And then I started looking at Solomon in the Bible and how, um, he, you know, 
we talk about how he had all of these different women from all of these different cultures and how it turned him against God. But at the same, but we forget that in the beginning, he asked for a heart of God. He had God's heart, which means God led him outside of, of Judaism. God led him outside right. to seek everywhere, to find everywhere. God in every person that you meet. And so that's what began to open my eyes. Me and that girl broke up after seven years. Wow. It was seven years wow. of me just trying. And you know what? This is the first time I'm going to say this publicly, Brady. I am a gold star gay. It's just not meant for me to have sex with a woman. I have tried a million and one times and that is okay. I'm finally okay within what my creator made me. My creator had this in mind for me, for me to experience mm -hmm. this. And what do I mean by my creator? I mean me. <laughs> I mean you. I mean your son. I mean your roommate. I believe that we are all the creator. We are all yes. God having these individual experiences just so we can get to know ourselves better. And that's why I have the grace and patience to accept people that are still in the church because you can only go as far as where your awareness is. And their awareness is still very egocentric, right? Their, exactly. their egos feel good. I belong to this country club. I'm better than you. I'm going to heaven. Are you? And really mm -hmm. what they don't understand is that you're just stroking your ego ego. You've never been more like a Pharisee than when you are standing on the corner judging your brother and your sister. When you're disfellowshipping someone, you are like the vipers that Jesus was talking about. So exactly. you are being a son of Satan. And, 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 whew, okay, let me take a deep breath because I can get a little <laughs> passionate. I can get a little passionate. What I'm finding is this is church for me, Brady, me and you speaking yeah. right here, us having this communion together. Yeah. This is community. This is what I crave. I don't have to go give 10% of my money. I don't have to serve every Saturday. I don't have to like give from an empty well in order to gain acceptance of an imaginary God. No, I accept myself as I am today. No one's coming to save me because I have saved myself. And I that is why that. I am secure. Yeah. I uh, recently was speaking with uh, my friend, Reverend Dr. Sherry Paulus. We talk mm. about... Just theology as a storytelling technique, but also mm. just the focus on us and who we are. Yes. And, and yes. the difference, we, we had a discussion about the difference between talking about our experience, which is representation versus advertisement, which is what mm. religion kind of taught us to do and condition yes. us to little baby marketers for where <laughs> when even when we talked about our experience of like what we went through, it was always done in a marketing way technique yep. towards God. Yep. Everything was done in a way that gave him credit for the good things that we did while we took the the the, the blame of the bad yep. and created yep. this bad transactional inappropriate relationship with us and this like yes. idea of God. What I hear you saying on the other hand is when we talk with each other and we're talking with our experiences one-on-one -on -one, that eye to eye through technology, yeah. that yeah. eye to eye <laughs> is what matters because at the yes. heart of it is that human experience and what yes, is the human yes, yes, is real. yes. Because you and I can't, we can't sit and say, God saved, or let me put it this way um, I prayed really hard and God kept me from being gay. Yeah. I, can't make, I, can't, I can't say that and be honest with you. Yeah, no. But I can say is, we both struggle with that fucking bullshit. We put yep. everything that we could within it. We tried yep. everything we could and we could yep. say, you can't pray the gay away. So what <laughs> matters to me is not the God part. What matters to me is the human experience part. Yes. Yes. You Accept yourself. Do no harm. Learn how to do no be, harm. Learn yes. how to be gay without doing harm, without yes. doing that toxic closeted bullshit yeah like let's find a way to do that without harming others yes yes and and honestly when you talk about the human experience that's what i'm gonna bring that's become my my philosophy we i want this human experience that means i have to accept the highs and the lows i can't appreciate the highs without the lows and it also means that we are dualist we are dualistic by nature means we have a shadow and we have a light and when you are trying 
to just push away the shadow all the time and live in the, the so-called light, you're not being authentic to yourself. You're not being fair to yourself. And that's why we have a lot of Christians that have suppressed anger and suppressed sexuality. They just suppressing things left and right because the joy of the Lord is their strength. <laughs> well, no, the joy of the Lord is not your strength. You're depressed and you're manic and you need therapy. You, and that's what the church is full of. It's full Preach. of people that have been traumatized who are trying to help other traumatized people. And the church is supposed to be this hospital for sick people, but sick people never get better. No, we just get deeper in our ego and we convince ourselves that we become better. I hung out with a Russian friend yesterday and she said something that was just really key because she was raised in Russia. She was raised in communism and there was no religion. And so she was raised with the thought that religion is rules for dumb people. <laughs> religion is for people that do not know how to control themselves. That So they need to be told how to control themselves. You shouldn't, your motivation for doing good shouldn't be a crown in heaven. Your motivation shouldn't be because there's someone in heaven that's going to send you to hell. Your motivation should be because you are a good person that wants to do kind things to be for people. Like what it's, is your motivation? It's so much of our morality and how we look at ethics now has to do with what harm does it create to people around us? Yes. But before, but before the basis was, it was given, spoon fed to us from a dish. Yes. And so yes. when we're used yes. to being spoon fed, we're used to just getting the fish, but not knowing how to fish. Yes. So I oh, see the good. difference between like how we were in fundamentalism and taking the Bible literally. That was just being handed fish over and the same fish over and over and over. Right. And we all kind of got sick of mm -hmm. the fish. Mm -hmm. um, I, we all have experienced times with pastors where it's like, oh my God, you're just preaching the same things over and oh, over. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Run and out it's of the same with about. like giving that same fish and it's all you've got. But humanism and this other idea of centering ethics around a community. Are mm. you creating harm? Are you communicating well? Are you respecting consent? Those are the things that yes. matter. That's what yes. we really teach people that, and then now they know how to fish. Thank they can you. Their own morality. And emotionally mature people. You're you're raising up emotionally mature people. I, I find that, um, and I'm not going to blanket all Christians this way, but there's a lot of Christians that don't know how to deal with conflict that don't know how to deal with being offended, that don't, that stay in abusive relationships because there's no boundaries. Like, why are we not uh. learning boundaries in the church? And I'll tell you why we don't learn boundaries in the church, because then the pastor can't exploit your talents and your gifts and your time. <laughs> if you have boundaries, then no, you won't serve that extra service. <laughs> if you have boundaries, then no, you won't give more than that 10% that's so, you know, supposedly required of you. So I feel like, um, and what Most scripture pastors, are you going to use? Sorry. The one where Jesus said, just keep on being slapped over and over? Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I honestly, therapy taught me a lot about, uh, you know, religious PTSD. Um, I didn't realize how I was just walking around feeling like I was just in trouble all the time. Yes. And that was my therapist. And she's like, oh, that, that anxiety that you feel, yeah, that's religious PTSD. No one's mad at you, honey. No one's mad at you. So I had to learn how to release my inner critic. I had to learn how to change my self-speak, how to talk to myself with kindness and compassion. And so there was a book by Louise Hay that really helped with my healing after deconstruction and it's mirror work. Um, she taught me how to talk to myself in the mirror, how to if you can't love what you see when you look in the mirror, at least you can start with saying, I'm learn I'm willing to learn to love you. I'm willing to learn to accept you. And that willingness is half the battle. If you are willing, then I feel like, you know, life meets you halfway. Fuck. And so I also wanted to mention the stages of grief that come from deconstructing, you know, you, you are grieving your old self. You are grieving everything you've ever been taught. You're also grieving the life you're not going to have that you once envisioned for yourself. And we have to give ourselves permission to grieve, to go through the denial, to go through the bargaining, to go through the anger. Oh, the anger stage probably lasts the longest. Um, just being like, it's valid. why? It's valid. Yeah, and yes. so valid. And, and so I implore you to feel your feelings. Don't suppress them. Feel that anger. Scream, run, rage. Do whatever you have to do to get yeah. that energy out of your body. Because as you move that energy out of your body, you're making space for healing. 
and acceptance. And once I was able to move through the rage, through like, you know, this shit was not fair. It wasn't fair that I got singled out and sat down when there was adultery being committed. What made my sin so much greater? Right, you know, right. sit in that, feel that. Once I was able to feel that, I was then able to say, Jamar, you're right. It wasn't fair. And I love you. And so I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a chance to have the life that you didn't have. Let's try new things. Let's, let's, I met an amazing guy a year and a half ago, well, almost two years ago now. And he, by me allowing myself to be loved by him was the most gracious thing I could do for me. And it took a lot of yeah. silencing my inner critic. It took a lot of me silencing. Uh, it didn't feel right in the beginning. It didn't feel right. Intimacy didn't feel right because <laughs> I wasn't used to it. But I kept telling myself, you deserve this. You deserve consistency. You deserve openness. If I was still had a sin mentality or, or, or was living in shame and regret, then no, I wouldn't manifest things that, 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 that show my worth back to me. You understand what I'm saying? My worth will always be reflected back to me. So if I think that God is mad at me, I'm going to keep manifesting situations that look like sin, that look like sin. But once I started saying, I'm not, I'm done giving my power away. I'm going to stand in my power and the power is a, I, that I have as a human. Okay. I'm going to stand in this power. And as I began to stand in that power, Brady doors began to open for me. And it's because I stopped waiting for shit to happen. I stopped waiting for God to move. And I started moving myself because God gave me the authority and the power to move. Love is my God. Um, and when I think of God, I don't think of a personhood. I think of an energy. I think of an energy that I can tap into that is my natural birthright. My natural birthright is love, healing, abundance, joy, peace, what they call the fruits of the spirit. That is my natural birthright. And the only way that they're I human can things, they're human they, things. Thank you. And the only they way that I can to all of us. They belong to everyone. It's not a special gift. It's not a club that you have to join. It's really just an awareness, right? And the awareness is. I no longer subscribe to the illusion that I'm separate from God. Meaning when I subscribe to that illusion that I've been separated from the fall, from the garden, because of that, we we're born sinful. There's this, there's this, there's veil that comes up between me and love. But when I say, well, no, I'm born of love. I was, I wasn't born sinful. I was born perfect. And even though I may make mistakes, that doesn't take away from my perfection. It means I'm having a human experience. It means that, that I can then take on. We would, I would call it shame, a feeling of shame. undeserving. All of that. Und and right. it's all self-imposed. It's all self-imposed. This, this belief that I am separate from my divinity. Mm -hmm. Once I shifted my awareness from separation to I am one with my divinity, well, then I'm unstoppable. There's no one that can tell me no. Even if it's a no right now, it, it becomes a yes later because I keep going. I keep pushing. I'm now not afraid to take responsibility for the decisions that I make. And, I, and, I, and that was a big one for me coming out of the church where you're always deferring your, your, your decision making. I now know that I've been equipped. I can handle. I trust my inner guidance. I trust my own inner compass. And that comes from listening to the heart. I believe that the heart is how we always get back in touch. Uh, whenever I find myself... Whenever I find my awareness shifting to the illusion of separation where I'm not good enough, I'm, I'm, I'm where it's just negative, just negative self-speak. I know that I can shift my awareness by getting in touch with my heart. And how do I do that? By sitting in silence with my heart. Elijah didn't hear the voice of God and with the earthquake, didn't hear him in the storm, but he heard him in the still small voice, which is your heart. It is your guidance. It is your compass that will never lie to you. And if you think about it, Brady, our hearts were always telling us you're a gay little boy. And you want to be gay. You want to frolic and you want to have a limp wrist and you want to be happy about it. However, we were conditioned to ignore that part of ourselves, but our hearts never lied to us. Okay. I remember I told you earlier, I, I didn't realize that I was gay, 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 gay until I was 14, but I wanted a poly pocket in fourth grade. <laughs> Okay. And I wanted a okay. or my little pet shop, and I, yeah. or, you know, I had a scuba diving Kindle. I, you know, <laughs> like I had these like a very effeminate things about me that I had to like code and change code, the context yes. up so that it wanted out me for who I was, and I was scared to expose that. Right, a big part of your story was getting sober, getting off dependencies. 
can you talk about that? I know that's a huge part within the gay community and the yeah. community especially. Um, do you differentiate between the words sober and dependent? How does that work for you? Well, I know that for people that are in 12 step programs, uh, the word sober carries a lot of weight with them. So I'm really careful around that word. I don't consider myself sober because I smoke weed. Um, and for me, weed has been just a, a big blessing in dealing with uh, ADHD, um, some restlessness that I go through. And Absolutely. also just with my, with my meditation and journal time, I, I like to smoke a little bit. And with my, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I like to create while I'm high. But at one time, I was needing to be high every second of the day. And, and I don't need that anymore. And at one time I needed to put things up my nose every day or smoke some meth and I'm not there anymore. So I also want to preface this by saying, um, I, I stopped doing meth back in 2006. So we're talking about a very long journey. Okay. Um, I did not quit using Coke right away. I still had a problem. Um, I think that what has helped me give up coffee <laughs> with over the last year and give up, mm -hmm. um, which was probably like my biggest addiction, um, was me caring about my nervous system, <laughs> me learning that I was living in a heightened state of fight or flight because of what I was doing because of some of my habits. Um, wow. and so I started looking into what I can do to calm my nervous system so that I'm just moving around through life in a more calmer, more peaceful, more gentle way. I don't need to be speedy all the time. I used to need right. to feel that speediness to, to feel productive. Um, no, I don't need to No, Some days you don't have to be productive. Who says some days you can just sit still and, and know that you're good <laughs> and that's okay. I relate to that so much. There's, um, a ma I love master classes. I, yeah. You know, subscribe this last year because I'm like, it's yeah, me too. I mean, you know, me too. Why are we the same and, person? Wow, me too. <laughs> and one that I really loved was RuPaul's give or take. Some people love, some people hate. I <laughs> right in the middle. But one thing that I loved that RuPaul talked about was being addicted to being running late and wow. how a lot of wow. people how a lot of people have this weird subconscious self-sabotaging habit wow. of people procrastinating way into the end because they are motivated, but also because of that addicted to that endorphin rush that comes up being. And that was a wow. big, wow. I never thought about that. Wow. And, um, touched into his, his masterclass had a lot to do with just self-reflection and then self-expression through, you know, the heightened sense of drag and the heightened wow. culture, et cetera. Um, but it, it was one of those few wow. like little nuggets that you hear in a place that you don't expect and it just sticks with you. Yeah. But I hear what yeah. you're saying. We we get used to that and it becomes our normal. And then a lot of times because we're used to it, and if there isn't a drama there, there's a vacuum there and then that vacuum gets filled by some self-sabotaging inner critic voice like you had mentioned yes or yes a story that we're telling ourselves over and over one of those old cassette tapes of our past that's been replayed too many times wow. yes we fill it up with that and yes. then it becomes that yes yes i yes one thousand percent yes i also find that um on the road to healing, there is this need. Uh, I've, I've had to, I've caught myself creating drama internally lots of times. And I'm like, well, no, you're just, everything's going good for you right now. <laughs> like everything's going really good and you're trying to create a problem to fix. And that's another addiction, just like trying to always find something to fix. Well, no, sometimes you like, I don't know. I've just been really just resting in the fact that all is well, all is well. All is well and nothing at this exact moment requires my attention that requires me to be speedy and all up in arms. Uh, the whole world appreciates it when I show up in a more calm, more peaceful manner. I appreciate it the most. <laughs> my inner self appreciates that. Yeah. Christianity kind of created this feeling of being micromanaged that oh. everything that we went through is supposed to be a lesson because we yes. normalized the storytelling of the Bible. That was our precedent yes. that we grew up with. So every conflict that we did, humans are meaning makers and a normal person goes through a conflict and says, 
here's the practical things that I can learn from this. Mm -hmm. When Mm -hmm. we as Christians went through it, we're like, there's the practical, but why do we go through that? What is God trying to tell us? What is yes. Thing? What is what do we? Yep. How do we glorify Him? How do we? How do? How, how do we glorify Him? And, yep. and, 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 and it's just this vacuum and it sucks yep. all this other bullshit wow. in and yes. creates an extra drama that we just yes. don't need anymore. No, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't need it. I don't. I mean, some people may need it. I don't personally need it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love it. What are you up to nowadays? What does your life look like? Oh, I just released my first song in two years, which was, uh, it took me a year to get it out. And it's probably the most honest thing I've ever created because it talks about how much anxiety I had when I first fell in love with James and how um, I had to deal with my own, like, anxiety, uh, my, my, my anxious attachment style, but, but also not being used to anything so healthy and feeling so right. I had, I was trying to, I almost ran, I almost, I almost fucked it up a lot in the beginning. Um, so the song is about that and learning how to flow, how to surrender to the flow of life. Because if you do surrender to the flow of life, you will be taken care of. I guarantee you, um, it's time to get out of your own way. It's time for you to realize that, um, the good news, the gospel, the good news is that no one's coming to save you. <laughs> That's the good news. And because you don't need saving, you don't need any yes. saving. There's no, there's nothing wrong with you that you don't need to be rescued from yourself. You yourself, you're a beautiful thing. You're a beautiful place to be um, on your worst day. You're a beautiful place to be. This experience is beautiful. The highs, lows, all of it is beautiful. If we'll just surrender to the flow of it at, to the best of our ability. I know it's not always easy when you're facing a lot of circumstances that don't seem like they're working out for you. But one thing I know for a fact, and I've lived enough, enough life on my 39 years on this planet to know that every single thing works out for your good. Every single thing works out for your good. Your worst day is building you up for something better. And not, not for the good of those who love. You're just talking about fucking humans. You're just talking about. Just as a human. All of us. All of us. All of us. All of us. Not, a, not dependent on our beliefs. No. But just no, not on at us all. being humans. Human. Because here, yes, yes. Yes. Because here. Okay. Yeah. We were taught that only things work out for good because you're loving God. And I'm saying things work out. Even your most negative emotions are here to teach you something. My abuser that I was with, I thank God every day for him because from him, because if he had not blackmailed me about my HIV status, I would have never stood in front of 14 million people and told my story. And then I got a career. My life took off. So what he meant for evil turned around to be the best thing that happened in my life. (laughs) And and that had nothing to do with me loving God. That had everything to do with loving myself giving myself a chance. And so what I'm imploring of every person that is, that is going through a deconstruction phase or they're questioning the same, the same opportunity that you were willing to give a faceless God, give yourself that opportunity. Shit. Watch miracles happen when you decide to take a step out on faith on you, when you believe in their, your talent, when you believe in your passion, when you believe in your dreams, when you have that book inside of you and you actually start writing the words and you start seeing how it responds to people by you telling your story, then you will start to build up faith in yourself. Then you'll start to build up this, this trust in your inner, your inner guidance. Because right now we just need to believe in our ourselves that's all i can say please believe in you please believe in you if you will take a chance on you your life will show you things that you never could have imagined but it takes you believing in you you are your savior that's the good news fuck i love everything you're saying i've been thinking of just a couple of little little catchphrases and then we'll we'll close the episode. Sure, sure. I got a little that? preachy. You, I'm sorry. No, how, <laughs> I do got a little that? Loud. how do you top that? I think of theology as supposed to be a storytelling technique of mm. what we're going through at a time. But what I'm more focused on is weology, the story of us. Ooh. What are we what are we going through? And like what is the honesty of our stories? And I think of we are greater sign greater than I am. What that tells me is that Mm. we share experiences. It's more meaningful than when I just talk about myself, but it's also more meaningful when we just advertise. I am, we just advertise God. 
Um, we are greater than I am. Yes. Oh, I love is, that. Is there anything else that I'm missing that we need to touch before we close this? Because um, I'm just, I'm goosebumps. <laughs> I just want to thank you for having me, Brady. I just want to remind everyone listening uh, that you are perfect. You are absolutely perfect. Just the way you are. Those things that you hate about yourself are absolutely beautiful. They're perfect. And my prayer for everyone listening is that they will come into the realization that they will return back to themselves, which is really a return to love. Mm. Thank you all so much for listening. And remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second Saturday. (laughs) This has been an episode of the Life After podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on TeePublic, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. Used to hate myself, congratulations, you played yourself out of mental health and living in self. Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony. Don't believe the church is a bribe, but she owe me alimony. I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony. Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle matrimony. And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire. Fighting gas, lighting leaders like your ways are not higher. I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire. You threw the gasoline. I'm just spitting matches through the wire. I'm just trying to break them free, make them see the refrains and mental chains of slavery. I disagree with any preacher, teacher, not on defeat. I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory. I'm complete. And everybody sings, and everybody sings. Please, pull some strings from me. Go, 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 go.